Classical music is often regarded by most critics and a lot of society as quote-unquote art music, often the kind of music that you need to spend time absorbing to truly appreciate. Now, innate in this description is the idea, somehow, that classical music is meant only for the upper crust of society, only for those who have both the time and the money to spend a night out at the symphony or the opera. And while this may have been true in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, as of the early 20th century, this is no longer exclusively the case. In fact, since that time, one could make the argument for the emergence of a latent punkish impulse in classical music that has become a core tenet of its recent iterations. From Penderecki to Hovhannes, composers throughout the 20th century sought to bring classical music down to the quote, real and gritty in a way that had not been common before. However, no other work demonstrated the perfect fusion between classical music and avant-garde cabaret performance art better than Eric Satie and Pablo Picasso's 1917 ballet, Parade. In many ways, Eric Satie and Pablo Picasso could not have been more perfect collaborators. While Satie is often thought of as a contemporary of the so-called, quote, impressionist composers, such as Debussy and Ravel, the truth is his groundbreaking compositions from the Ogives to the Gymnepides to the Dances Gothiques and the Gnossians, in fact, predated the seminal impressionist work of both aforementioned composers by about 15 years. Despite inspiring Debussy and Ravel and the movement of impressionism in general, he quickly discarded the new musical movement of his initial disciples and jumped ahead, moving away from his initial sound to a sound that would influence a whole host of new young composers, most importantly, many members of Les Cis. Satie was an energetic, progressive composer who, as he aged, only became more daring in his new directions in harmony and form. And this being the early 20th century, collaboration between artists from different fields, including the visual arts, were starting to become more and more common, in contrast to the strict poet plus composer combo stuck to in the 19th century, i.e. Goethe and Beethoven. And this is where Pablo Picasso comes in. Now, I am sure Picasso needs no introduction. The man is still so damn famous, his name literally became a meme less than a month ago on TikTok. Okay, I like it, Picasso. Like Setee, Picasso was a pathbreaker, a vagabond, and a visionary. The visual arts before his arrival looked one way, and then after, never the same again. He pioneered multiple new techniques, including neoclassicism, cubism, and primitivism, to name a few. It's debatable, but one could make an entirely valid case that Pablo Picasso was the greatest visual artist of the 20th century. However, what a lot of people do not know is that Picasso actually had interests in multiple fields of art outside his primary field of expertise. It was in this spirit, through the negotiations of debonair avant-garde renaissance man Jean Cocteau, that Picasso found a fellow artistic traveler in Eric Satie. Through the aforementioned meeting brokered by Cocteau, Satie and Picasso agreed that they would collaborate together on a ballet. The scenario suggested would be a showcase parade, akin to the kind one could see on the streets of Paris at the time, such as during the World Fair in 1900. During a meeting, it was decided that the name of this upcoming ballet would simply be, well, Parade. In order to make the most cultural impact possible, the trio settled on getting Sergei Diaghilev's famous Ballet Russes to fund and put on the production of Parade. By this point in time, the Ballet Russes had become famous for showcasing some of the most innovative musical works of the early 20th century, chief among them Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, Firebird and Petrushka, Ravel's Daphnis et Chloé, Boulogne's Le Biche, and Darius Milo's Le Tremble Bleu, also with artistic direction by Picasso. After winning the favor of the notoriously fickle Misa Edwards, who often acted as a de facto talent scout for Diaghilev, the Ballet Russes agreed to put on the production of Parade for the season starting 1917. Now, there are many distinct elements of Parade that make it so special and place it in this strange nebulous zone somewhere between traditional ballet and avant-garde performance art piece. Eric Satie up until this point was a well-known composer among French musicians and was just beginning to get the attention of the French press as a composer who had changed music, and was also being acknowledged as the forefather of both Debussy and Ravel's harmonic innovations, much to Debussy's chagrin at the time. By the time of Parade, Satie had composed almost exclusively solo pieces for the piano that often barely lasted more than two minutes. He had composed a few scant orchestral pieces, such as the ambient precursor collection of pieces known as furniture music, as well as the violin and piano chamber duet 
things seen right to left. But for the most part, he refrained from the grand orchestral compositions of his peers and disciples. With Parade, however, the world was finally able to see what Satie's unique take on harmony would sound like when mixed with large orchestral forces. The first thing to note about Parade is its form. While the musical forms in a lot of ballets tend to be much more loose than that of, say, a symphony, the form of Parade is unique even in this regard. Because the nature of Parade's story was to showcase various performers involved in a street parade, the music subsequently took on a defined sequential nature. Cells of music were presented one after another meant to evoke the nature of the circus-like characters at the center of Parade's scenario. However, that did not mean the music was entirely formless or unconnected. Throughout the piece, Satie uses repeated themes to correspond with each character, for example, the conjurer, the small American girl, the acrobats, etc. As these characters interact with their environments and act out their roles, Satie begins to tinker with and modify each theme to highlight certain gesticulations made by the characters. These could be abrupt rhythmic or meter changes, modifications to the tonality of any given theme or figure, or harmonic modulation of the underlying harmonic structure. And let us talk about Satie's orchestration here. Contrary to what many people at the time said about Satie, and some still say today, his ability in orchestration, as showcased here in Parade, is highly developed and his choices are perfectly suited to the avant-garde nature of the piece. The opening of Parade takes the form of an almost mocking Wagner-style chorale, before launching into a soft violin figure that features a melody in violin 1, augmented with seconds accompaniment in violin 2. This is then followed by a fugal opening of the Prelude of the Red Curtain, where we really see the collision of Satie's unique harmonic style with the power of a full orchestra. The fugue opens normally enough, albeit built on a subdominant relationship rather than a dominant one, before collapsing halfway through into a chromatic passage. The use of the harp here as a transitory element is something that will return throughout the rest of Parade. Following the opening chorale and prelude, we get the music of the Circus Conjurer, the first theme music of the piece, soundtracked specifically for a character. The music is scored in a sprightly 3-8 time signature, and the mixing of Satie's unique sense of harmony with an almost 17th, 18th century fast passapide or giga dance rhythm, we get something that truly sounds of its time and forward thinking, anticipating the coming neoclassicism of Stravinsky, for example. Another thing to note from the piece is the way Satie scores the lighter moments of melody for violins, piccolo, and harp in unison. Something about this combination of instruments for me creates a strange, almost psychedelic feeling to the circus-like melodies they play that most orchestrators would not think to utilize. The next section, entitled The Small American Girl, something apparently both Satie and Picasso assumed would be in a French circus circa 1915, is an amazing mishmash of minor second grinding chromatic harmony and nods to American composer John Philip Sousa's brass marches, along with also subtle nods to the cakewalk and other black styles of music that had taken hold in America at the turn of the 20th century. Finally, Parade ends with a piece for duo entitled The Acrobats, which features a fast waltz with modern Parisian harmony, along with Satie including in the orchestra the xylophone and musical bottles to give the piece a further surreal feel. Parade then closes out with a slightly triumphant final act in two that acts somewhat as an ending overture in that it actually splices together a few key motifs of the previous sections, again, albeit twisted and compacted, with a special emphasis on brass and woodwinds. When this so-called ending overture comes to a close, the music of Parade is at an end. And that is a brief summation of the music of Parade. There is, however, one more thing to add about the orchestration that firmly puts this piece in the avant-garde. Once the score was completed by Satie, and he presented it to the team consisting of himself, Diaghilev, Picasso, and Cocteau, it was felt, particularly by Cocteau, that the piece did not have the necessary qualities to cause a success du scandal. The phenomenon of provoking a backlash against a composer and his, her new radical piece among audiences and critics. The most famous of this example before Parade was the notorious premiere of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, which was said to have started a riot due to the audience's reaction, though this is disputed. Either way, Cocteau was convinced that causing this phenomenon would only help Parade's publicity and spark ticket sales. So, somewhat to Satie's dismay, Cocteau ended up adding various soundscape elements to the score. 
a 19 teens era police car siren, a typewriter, a gunshot, shot from the side of the stage with a blank loaded pistol, mind you, and a spinning lottery wheel, to name just a few of the elements. While the incorporations of found sounds or non-musical items into a score had been done before, see Mahler's Sixth or the anvils from Wagner's Ring Cycle, the way in which these items were incorporated into Parade led the way for so many more future compositions to incorporate sounds that would have previously been considered absurd or a novelty. On the art side of the project, Picasso went all out in his designs for Parade in an attempt to further emphasize the pre-psychedelic nature of the piece. Picasso was in the zenith of his cubist phase and had been regarded, like Satie, as a pathbreaker that reinvigorated the visual arts. However, this was his first time stepping out and collaborating with an artist from another field and he truly took advantage of it. Using the principles of cubism, Picasso designed sets that attempted to portray a parade in a zoned out avant-garde sense atypical of the more illustrative and elegantly designed ballet background sets of the time. Additionally, in some of the costuming of Parade, Picasso took incredible artistic risks that without the support of the institution of the Ballet Russes, he might not have been able to get away with. In order to showcase his cubist style, Picasso designed grand costumes of angular shapes consisting of squares, rectangles, and triangles. Subsequently, this ended up limiting the movements the dancers would be able to perform fluidly without damaging the costume. While this no doubt frustrated choreographer Leonard Massin, it nonetheless added a further surreal element on top of all the other trippy elements of Parade. Ultimately, Picasso's success here would go on to encourage him to collaborate with other composers, such as Stravinsky for Puccinella, Manuel de Falla on El Sombradero de Tres Picos, or Satie himself 10 years later on 1927's Mercure. In the early 20th century, ballet often served as the backdrop for some of the most innovative music composed. Eric Satie and Pablo Picasso's Parade is no exception. Even among the 20th century's many innovative ballets, Parade stands out not only for its unique harmony and orchestration, but for its art direction and extra musical elements as well. Its depiction of everyday life stood in contrast to the post-Wagnerian romanticism popular in the previous century. It is an essential work that every fan of classical music should listen to, as it truly creates a world of its own, both sonically and visually.